when I was first invited to come to Johnson and Wales and talk about women in leadership, I was ecstatic. I was excited, and I thought, like, yes, because that's what I do. A lot of the research that I do either stems from women in leadership, or is research on women in currently in leadership positions. But my next immediate thought was. Mm, I'm going to be a guy talking about women's issues. I don't know how that's going to roll. Um, so I kind of just want to clear the air and say that I'm not going to sit here and mansplain what women's issues are for you. Um, a lot of what I'm going to be presenting is basically the research that's out there that's existing, um, statistics, and just kind of putting, some, putting it all together to give us some insight as to what women are actually experiencing and what are ways that we can help them out. So I want to start with just to give us a general scope of what the problem is, right? And so we know that the majority of women are, <laughs> are actually dominating the, the population, right? We have 51% are women, but when we look at what rates of women are attaining in different leadership positions, it doesn't actually reflect that same exact number. And that's where the problem comes from. Women are 51% of the population, but when it comes to middle management positions, they're about 40% which isn't too big of a gap, right? But as we move up the hierarchy, we see that at the Fortune 500 level, only 4% of CEOs are women. So we see that there's a clear gap, and the gap gets bigger as you go up the ladder. Now, we can also look at race and ethnicity. When we look at race and ethnicity and break these statistics down even further, we see that women of color are disparaged more often than white women are. right? And so there's a lot of room for us to learn about why these things happen, and we have a lot of gaps to close. But before we kind of jump into all those causes, um, I wanted to kind of define some terms that I'm going to be using quite frequently. So this is more like a scientific talk, so just kind of bear with me. But the first thing that we want to uh, talk about is communion. So communion is basically the tendency for people to want to establish like interpersonal relationships, um, establish intimacy with other people. And so an example of this in the workplace would be like asking your coworker, hey, how's your day going? Uh, how's your kids? Things like that. And another term that I want to introduce you to is agency. And so agency is kind of like the opposite of communion, or not the opposite, but it's the other, it's the yin to the yang. And so agency is people's tendency to want to enhance their own power um, or enhance their own mastery of something. And so an example of that in the workplace is asking for a promotion. Right? And so asking for promotion is an attempt to increase your social status, your level of power within the workplace. Now, those two things are important because I think most of you probably can catch that communion is something that's more strongly aligned with what we think of as a stereotypical female gender role. Right? The female gender role is dominated by women supposed having to be nice and warm and caring and concerned and sympathetic. But that's all stereotypes. Right? But stereotypes do drive the way we behave. They drive the way that we think about people. Now, agency is the other end of it. Right? And so agency is what we align more with the male stereotypical gender role. Right? And so we perceive men as being assertive and forceful and dominant, and they go for their goals. Right? Now, how does this all come together with leadership? Well, historically, men have attained these leadership roles and held them for a long time. And so for years and years, women were in the house and men were out there making money, right? And so what that ended up res uh, causing was people to think that leadership, the default leader, is a man. And the actual performance of leadership overall is masculine. But this isn't actually the truth. But at the end of the day, these things exist, not even at just at the conscious level. Some of us consciously might think, well, when you think of a man, you just say a male pronoun, right? That's kind of a common thing that people do. But even at a, at a subconscious level, these things impact the way we perceive people, the way we interact with people. And so when it comes to women in leadership, although this idea of like, oh, it's at a subconscious level, it probably doesn't have as much of an impact. It actually is really insidious for women in leadership. Because what ends up happening is that when we think of the prototype of a, of a leader, it's male. And when a woman is, promo is aiming to try to get a promotion, she doesn't necessarily fit that stereotype as well as a man would. And so what that happens is that women are not promoted at the same rates as men are, even though they may be equally qualified. Now that's just the tip of the iceberg. That's like the beginning of the problems. Because even when a woman goes through the ringer of trying to get promoted, and she does get promoted, and she attains her leadership position, the problem is that even in leadership positions, women are often unable to 
perform the agentic behaviors that are required for leadership. When you're a leader, you have to tell people what to do. You have to be dominant sometimes. You have to be forceful. You have to critique your subordinates. And so all these things are agentic behaviors, but women are often unable to do so without experiencing some form of a backlash, right? Now, another tragic part is that women are also expected to be communal in their leadership roles. And so it's not enough that a woman isn't forceful and dominant, and therefore I may not like her, but she also has to be nice and warm and caring and polite to me for me to accept her leadership. Now, as if all of that wasn't tragic enough, um, what we see is that for men, when men behave agentically, there's no penalty for men behaving agentically because that's what we expect of men. We expect men to be dominant in the workplace. And then when men act communally, they get a reward for it. So overall, what I'm saying is that women are unable to perform agentically while men can do so freely with no punishment. But women are also expected and required to be, be communal in their behaviors, but men get rewarded for those things. Right? And it's kind of like, if you want to think of a, of a more common everyday example, it's like when mothers take care of their kids every single day, but what happens when the dad changes the diaper? It's like, woo, dad of the year, right? So the same exact thing happens in the workplace, just obviously not with children, but just the way that we behave and carry ourselves, it results in different rewards and punishments depending on who's actually engaging in those behaviors. So what do we do with all this information, right? Like what, what is, there, is there a way out of this, right? And so there are some theories as to how we can get, how women can get out of this scenario. But really the overall problem is that there's a double bind that women have to face, right? Where on one hand, women can engage in leadership in a very feminine, stereotypical manner. But the result of that is that they're liked, people like them, like I like her, she's really nice to me. But does that mean you respect her? Does that mean you think that she's competent? And a lot of research demonstrates that when women engage in a feminine leadership style, they don't attain uh, likability and competence. It's always gonna be one or the other. And in terms of femininity, they get the likability aspect, but they're not seen as competent. They're seen as too soft, right? Now, on the other hand, if a woman engages in a masculine leadership style, she faces backlash because she's too tough, right? Why is this woman talking to me like this? I don't expect women who are supposed to be nice and caring. Now she's telling me what to do. What's up with that, you know? So that's the double bind that women face is, do you want to be liked but not respected, not seen as competent, or do you want to be competent but not very well liked, right? So what are some solutions to this? Now, theoretically, people have thought of transformational leadership as a potential leadership style that women can engage in that allows them to engage in leadership in a typical manner while also kind of spinning in some feminine characteristics in there. So if you've never heard of transformational leadership, it's basically a leadership that, style that has a couple of dimensions. Um, and some of them include showing con concern and care for your subordinates, making sure that they feel valued, which is where the feminine part comes in, right? And so a woman engaging in this leadership style doesn't seem like she's abandoning her, leadership, her, her gender role as much because she's being nice and warm and caring, right? But this transformational leadership style also includes aspects like intellectually stimulating your employees, motivating them, pushing them to perform better. So it's a nice blend of this agency and communion, right? Now, what, what this results in is, or what's theorized as what the result of this would be, is that women would then face less of a double bind dilemma. They'd face less of a backlash because now they get to engage in this leadership style that doesn't really put them in any one particular bucket, but gives them the freedom to kind of engage in both types of leadership. Both types of leadership. Now, research actually has found that women do engage in transformational leadership more often than men do which is interesting. And transformational leadership, when we look at several studies across my entire field, basically, we see that transformational leadership has positive outcomes at the individual, group, and organizational levels. So, seems like we got ourselves a solution, right? So how many agree that transformational leadership seems like a valid solution for women? You can raise your hand. I disagree. Plot twist. <laughs> no, I was counting on it. I was like, I hope no one, I hope everyone raises their hands. Um, so the reason why I say transformational leadership isn't the solution is because what we're telling women effectively is 
this is the leadership style that you need to perform in order for, you to, for people to accept you in a leadership position, right? And that's not really the solution, because essentially what we're saying is you need to walk this tight rope, or otherwise you're going to be punished for it. Right? And that's not the position that we want to put women in. We understand that historically women have been put on pedestals, but because they've been put on pedestals, they've been bound a lot in terms of how they're supposed to behave in several situations, including leadership. So although transformational leadership is theorized as a solution, um, my dissertation, or at least one half of my dissertation, is to quantitatively assess the extent to which transformational leadership actually is a solution for women. I'm not saying that, at the end of the day, it's not helpful, because I think it's helpful for us to understand what are the problems that women face, and what are the ways that, right now, women can help ameliorate those issues for themselves, right? But it's still not the end game, right? Because the end game is for women to engage in leadership such that they face the same rewards and penalties that men do. They can get away with the same, leadership, the same less than optimal leadership styles that men engage in, and they can also benefit from leadership styles that other men benefit with, right? So that's, a, that's one of the solutions, but there's a lot of research that looks beyond just these causes and solutions, right? Because gender, although it's one of the biggest reasons or one of the biggest issues that we're dealing with with leadership, one thing to also consider is that not all women's experiences are going to be the same, right? And so when we talk about women in leadership, we also have to consider what are other things that can play a role in this scenario. And so some of the most current research has looked at gender and race and the intersection of those to see how does, you know, do white women experience the same type of backlash and double bind issues that black women face? What about black men? Do they face a the type of backlash that maybe white men don't face, right? Interestingly enough, Black men do share something in common with white women, and it's that they both deal with backlash issues in terms of agency. Now, for white women, it's more so because it's counter-stereotypical, right? White women are expected to be nice and polite and caring, right? But when they engage in agentic leadership styles, we see a lot of punishments come from that. But with black men, it's actually stereotypical for black men to be agentic, and that agency comes from perceptions of them as a threat to the status quo. Right? Black men are not the, the ones in positions of power. The ones who are in positions of power are typically white people. And so when a black man is agentic as a leader, it seems like too much of a threat to the status quo. And thus, black men face an agency backlash similar to what women face in the workplace. Now, what about black women? Well, black women actually, research has shown that black women don't face an agency backlash. What's interesting is that Black women are in this nice kind of middle ground between white women and black men, where they are perceived as more masculine than white women, so they don't face the agency backlash because it's not as much of a counter stereotype for black women to be dominant. And then on the flip side, in terms of comparison to black men, we see that black women are seen as less of a threat to the status quo than black men. And so they don't face that issue of, well, if a black woman is in power, she's going to take over, right? But if that was 100% true, then what we'd see is that black women are actually very well represented in leadership. But as I mentioned in the beginning, women of color experience a lot more disparaging outcomes than white women. So why is it that black women are not experiencing the same level of success, even though they don't have this agency backlash? Right? Well, research has basically found that although black women don't have this agency backlash, there is a huge gap between the prototypical white male leader and a black female leader, right? That doesn't necessarily mean that that's automatically the problem. The problem happens when women, black women make mistakes. And so when black women make mistakes, it only serves as a reminder of what a gap there is between what we consider as a prototype for a leader and what this, a black female leader is like. And so when that gap is, when people are reminded of that gap, black women end up being disproportionately penalized way more so than black men and white women, right? So that all sounds very, very negative. But what I want to kind of point out is that there are some ways that we can help in these scenarios. And so one of the ways is to always consider these intersections, right? When we talk about women in leadership, it's not just enough for us to talk about white women. We need to be exploring at racial and ethnic minority women as well. Now, another aspect that we should, could also explore is sexuality and gender, and that's even newer. 
But that's the other half of my dissertation, is exploring what does this double bind look like for sexual minority women, right? Now what we know so far is that gay men are perceived as more feminine and less masculine than their heterosexual counterparts. And lesbian women are perceived as more masculine and less feminine than their heterosexual counterparts. But if the double bind is all about this idea of agency and communion and those, the mismatches between gender and leadership role, then how does it operate for gay men, right? Do gay men experience this sort of double bind because they're expected to be more feminine? What about lesbian women? Since they're expected to be more masculine, do they face less of a double bind in the leadership role, right? And so there's a lot of questions to answer. There's a lot of room for us to explore these things. But what I do want to offer prior to me finishing is just some potential solutions for us to consider, right? Things that we can do on a day-to-day -day basis. And my suggestions are going to differ depending on whether I'm talking to men or to women. And the reason why is because men and women have different roles in this goal, right? In this patriarchal society, men and women operate in different social locations, and men have a lot more power and a lot more say over situations than women do. And so the ways that we can contribute are going to be unique. Now, my suggestion for men is something that kind of comes from my experiences of being in a fraternity. And so being in a fraternity, you're surrounded by a hyper-masculine environment. You're surrounded by guys who say things about women that are not appropriate. And a lot of times, I, the one talking to you about women in leadership, bit my tongue. And I think it's easy for men to be with their, be with their guys, be with their buddies, and not say anything when people say sexist things, when they behave sexist, right? So what I challenge men to do is to call themselves out. I do it all the time in my classes. So when I teach, for example, and I talk about leadership and I use the, the male pronoun, I catch myself because that's automatically saying that women do not exist in this leadership domain, right? By automatically putting out a male gender pronoun, I'm kind of diminishing the reality that women are also leaders as well. Right? And so it's little things like that, being able to call yourself out, being able to call others out, that's going to help. But calling people out when women are around is easy. <laughs> and so the tough part is doing it when it's behind closed doors. Right? If anyone's seen Harry Potter, Neville Longbottom, when he stands up to Hermione and Ron and, and Harry because he thinks they're going to do something wrong, he gets awarded points. Right? And it's the same scenario here. It's going to be tough. But the status quo exists behind closed doors, right? And so for us to change the status quo, we need to attack it in that same exact space. Now, for women, and this is me attempting to not mansplain, I promise. So I'm going to take some advice from COO Facebook, Sheryl Sandberg. She gave a TED Talk on why we don't see a lot of women in leadership positions. And so one piece of advice that really, really stuck with me was don't leave before you leave. Now, what she meant by that was, don't put yourself in this mindset that I have to start caring and worrying about marriage and how, like, when I'm going to give birth, right? And so like, those things are important, and I understand that that's important, and I understand that society puts a lot of pressure on women to live this certain life where you, know, you have to get married and you have to have a kid. For some, that's natural, and that's totally natural for them, and they love it, and that's incredible. But what I want to encourage women to do is to not leave before they have to leave, right? What I mean by that is don't check out. Always push and thrive and try to get as far ahead as you can prior to having to make those decisions. Because really, at the end of the day, you're competing against men, right? And what are men thinking about? Not about family planning. When they get into positions, when they go for promotions, when they apply for things, they're hustling and they're pushing with no regard to worrying about, well, what about me having a kid, right? What about my family? I'm not saying that it's not something to consider, but it's not something to consider until you have to consider it, right? And one really nice thing that Cheryl mentioned is that if you push and if you reach a high level leadership position, you will have the flexibility to create the family that you want to create. And so until that point comes, don't step back, don't take your, your, your foot off the pedal, because it's an uneven race to begin with, and so we need women to push as much as they can. I need women to take their seats at this table, right? And so 
overall, what I want to say is that the future is female. It is coming. And so we need to be ready for it. But I also want to be alive for that day, when that day comes. And it's going to take a while. But I really do hope that each of us, on an individual level, really just puts effort towards making this a reality. Because it's, it's what my last six years have been about. And I can't think of a better way to basically go out is to see women in their rightful places. Thank you so much. Thank you.